Would anyone be willing to open us in prayer? Again? Jesus, we thank you uh, for this um, beautiful morning that you've blessed us with, Lord. And uh, as we're going to start our class um, in Christian history and missions, I pray, Lord, that we will learn something new today and that um, you would uh, listen. And uh, thank you, Lord, for everything in your name. I pray. Amen. Okay, let me just... Okay, so um, last week we had stopped somewhere in the 1860s. Uh, we were talking about D.L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon. Uh, so now we come to 1876 um, and um, talk about a missionary from Edinburgh, Scotland. So her name was Mary Slessor. Um, and she, um, when she was about 27 years old, heard about David Livingstone's death. Uh, and hearing about his death uh, kind of inspired her uh, to go out and uh, go into ministry. And so when she was 28, she left. She was from Scotland and she was uh, part of the Presbyterian Church. So through the Presbyterian Church, she went as a missionary. Uh, to a place uh, in West Africa, so Nigeria and West Africa, uh, and started to work among the Efik tribe. Um, that was uh, her work among these people, and she mainly uh, did a lot of work among children. Uh, so there was a belief in that tribe that if anyone had twins, uh, then one of those twins was... Uh, demonic or was uh, somehow possessed and so uh, they would put both the twins in clay pots and keep them out in the jungle uh, to die. So she kind of fought against that practice and was successful in rescuing all of these twins. So um, for those of you who are looking at the presentation, those are some of the twins that uh, she was working with. So the uh, children that were rescued uh, through their ministry. Uh, so, some other things that she accomplished through her mission, so she spent uh, several decades there, and so she did a lot of evangelism. Uh, she took care of orphan children, native children, promoted women's rights, uh, worked a lot to promote social change, uh, education, also worked with the local governmental authorities, so influenced governance in the place and encouraged trade. So she had an impact that was quite wide, apart from just working with the children, also um, reaching, like impacting the social, the economic, the uh, government of that time. So um, she made a huge difference in uh, Nigeria in the Calabar region. Um, 1878, um, so there was uh, someone named William Booth. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Salvation Army, but uh, so he and his wife were the founders of the Salvation Army. Um, he was a British Methodist preacher, and uh, he began to not only take the gospel to people, but he recognized that apart from taking the gospel, uh, we also should be helping people with their social or their physical needs. So uh, especially when you're ministering to the poor, you're ministering to people who are in bad situations, drug addicts, alcoholics, all of these people. How do you minister to their physical state as well as their spiritual state? So that was his main um, the difference in with which he approached how do you take the gospel to people. Uh, and so this made a huge impact on uh, a lot of people in society because uh, this was reaching people from poorer sections, people who were not usually welcome in the church. So prostitutes, 
criminals, uh, people who are excluded from within the normal church circles were people that this church or William Booth was reaching. Uh, and so he really touched the lives of the common people. Um, within his lifetime, there were 58 countries that were reached through this church. So not only were they uh, looking at social impact, they were also like taking the gospel to people in other countries. So missions was a huge part of what they were doing. Um, he wrote uh, a book called In Darkest England and the Way Out. And he also uh, wrote several songs. But this book was very important because uh, it became something that really impacted the way uh, people viewed how do we reach out to people who are uh, alcoholics, how do we reach out to the poor, how do we provide safety for prostitutes, for those who are homeless. Uh, it really impacted some of the decisions that were being made uh, by government, how the church was responding to these people, all of these things. So his work uh, made a big, big difference. You can see on this picture, this was his funeral. Um, so the streets were lined with people uh, just because of what he had done. So this is just not the church. This is people in London just gathering uh, because he had had such a big impact on their lives. Um, 1885, uh, there's a man named C.T. Studd. So he was an English cricketer. And I, I don't know if we covered him last week, did we? I feel like we did. Or maybe we even covered William Booth. So uh, C.T. Studd was an English cricketer, and he heard D.L. Modi preaching uh, the gospel. And while he heard him, he himself had this desire to start going out and preaching the gospel. So uh, 1878, was he had become a believer. 1883 is when he heard D.L. Modi preach. Uh, 1885, he joined Hudson Taylor in China, um, and he was actually very rich. He had received a, lot, a huge inheritance uh, from his family when he was very young, but he gave all of that up because he believed that he should fully depend on the Lord. So he gave all of that up uh, to uh, an orphan home and to missions, and then uh, decided to go into missions in China and depend completely on God to provide for him. Um, so a quote from him is, uh, some wish to live within the sound of church and chapel bell. I wish to run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. Uh, so that was his uh, desire to go out and reach people who were lost. Uh, Only One Life is a song that he had written. I'll just read the first paragraph. It's quite a beautiful hymn, but I'll just read one paragraph from it. Uh, Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Uh, so this was, um, I put the whole hymn here, but um, yeah, just one of the songs that he wrote that is still remembered today. Oh, sure, the... <laughs> okay. Uh, 1892, um, so this is when Amy Carmichael uh, was serving. Um, she began uh, her time in missions. So she was born in Ireland. And in 1892, she applied to the China Inland Mission. Um, so this, if you remember, China Inland Mission was started by uh, Hudson Taylor because he wanted to take the gospel into the interiors of China. So far, a lot of the missions had been happening on the uh, coastal areas, because that's where people could reach easily, right? By ship, you could reach uh, the coast, and you could reach the people on the coast. Uh, but he wanted to take the gospel into the interiors of China. And so he'd started this mission. And Amy had wanted to join the mission because she was not very well. Uh, they, she was not accepted into the China Inland Mission. 
So after that, she spent two years in Japan and Sri Lanka. Uh, and then in 1895, she came to South India and established an orphanage in Donavur, uh, Tamil Nadu. So after she arrived in India, she actually never returned home. So she spent 55 years uh, serving in India. And this orphanage specifically cared for young girls. So they would rescue temple prostitutes uh, and bring them to the orphanage uh, and take care. Yeah. And uh, take care of them. So these were uh, young girls who had been forced into prostitution. Uh, so she started this orphanage for those girls uh, and spent 55 years here. So the mission, uh, that orphanage still is present in South India. Uh, and her work continues then. Her name or the, the name of the orphanage? Oh, I don't know the name of the orphanage, um, but I was looking it up. I don't think um, I, we can look it up and see. I'm not sure the name of it. Um, yeah, someone can look it up. Feel free. What's it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, when asked what is missionary life like, Amy responded, missionary life is simply a chance to die. Uh, so that was her heart, was to give her whole life for missions. Um, OK, so with that, we come to the beginning of the healing revival. Um, we know that 1906 was the Azusa Street Revival, and that was when Pentecostalism really grew. Uh, but before that, there were lots of people who had already been talking about healing. And there were lots of moves of God in different places, uh, starting this thing of revealing to people that God still heals, uh, God still does miracles. And so this is a list of all the people who contributed to what happened in 1906. Uh, so uh, 1847 to 1907, there's someone named John Alexander Dowie, who's from Scotland. Uh, and he uh, studied in the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, and while he was there, he learned about healing. He uh, so There was someone named Edward Irving who had talked about, um, he talked against cessationist theology. So said that miracles are still for today, healings, the gifts of the spirit are still for today. So while he was in this university studying, he came across this teaching and it kind of impacted him. So he went to Australia where his family was already there. He went uh, back to join them in Australia and then started to pastor a church there. As he was pastoring the church, um, there was a disease that was uh, spreading across where their church was and lots of people within the church started to die. So he prayed for protection over the church and from that time on, no one in the church died. Uh, when that happened, he he recognized that okay, this was something that God had done. And he started to talk about healing more. Uh, and he uh, finally stopped pastoring that church and started to travel teaching about healing, uh, teaching that sickness uh, was from Satan and sickness is to be resisted. Um, and he um, actually became quite powerful and quite impactful in the work that he was doing. He moved to the US. Uh, he established a church there. Uh, but somehow in between, he got very kind of deceived or he lost track of what he was doing. Uh, he established a city that was called Zion. And uh, within that, people could come in and live there. Um, he owned all of the property in that place. So anyone who was staying there would be paying him rent, kind of would be paying for the land. Uh, and all the money was going into a bank that was there. And then he would use the money for all of the work that he was doing. But he was not using it wisely. So he kind of used more than that was there. Uh, so bad financial stewardship. Uh, he saw himself as the third Elijah. So there was Elijah, John the Baptist, and then he thought he was the uh, successor to them. So his teaching became a little like very, very deceived and 
kind of misled a lot of people. So although he did a lot of powerful work as one of the like, like right at the start with healing, talking about healing and impacting a lot of people. And many people were impacted by him who later on uh, became people who moved in this healing, who were part of the healing movement. Um, he also brought a lot of uh, doubt into this healing ministry because of these things that he did on the other hand. Um, 1844 to 1924, um, there was a lady named Maria Woodward, Woodworth Etter. Um, so she uh, had a very hard uh, beginning. So her parents died when she was very young. After she got married, five of her six children died. Uh, and she herself was very, very sick. So she prayed to God and said, if you heal me, then I will serve you for the rest of my life. Uh, and uh, I will go into ministry. Uh, and while she was sick, she had a lot of visions of children in heaven uh, and uh, the lost suffering in hell. Uh, so that those visions kind of led her to pray about God healing her so that she could serve him. Um, so God healed her. And she also asked God for the same apostolic power that the disciples had. Uh, so she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she says about that time, it felt like liquid fire. And there were angels all around. Uh, so she was filled powerfully with the Holy Spirit. And through that, actually, her preaching uh, was just empowered by the Holy Spirit. She would go out and preach. And many people would be saved just in one meeting. Uh, she established a huge church in the U.S. Uh, with um, 8,000 seater tent. So these were for tent meetings. Uh, there were 8,000 people who could sit in that tent and attend her meetings. So she had a huge impact as well. Um, Smith Wigglesworth, we already covered. Anthony talked about him. Uh, Lillian B. Yeomans was from Canada, USA. Uh, so she has an interesting story. She was a medical doctor, okay, and uh, she gave up her medical uh, work to start to minister to people. But while she was doing medicine with her sister, she got very addicted to, um, to drugs herself. Uh, and she started to depend heavily on these drugs uh, to the extent that she was completely bedridden. She couldn't. Uh, she couldn't do the work that she had to do, and she wasn't able to um, get out of that addiction because as soon as it was stopped, she would go into withdrawal, and there was fear that she would die uh, because she was so dependent on the drugs. Um, so she went to this first person, John Dowie, uh, who we talked about, one of his healing houses. And as she was there, she would have long periods of time when she was just alone by herself, uh, in her room. And so at that time, she started to read scripture. And uh, as she read scripture, she saw that scripture talks so much about healing, right from Genesis, uh, through the Old Testament into the New Testament, she saw that healing was in every part of scripture. And she started to believe that God would heal her, uh, because this is what she saw in scripture, and she started to pray about it. And suddenly, she realized that uh, she was completely free of the addiction. Uh, she was no longer dependent on it. And recognizing that her whole her own healing had come just from God's word uh, inspired her then to give up medicine and start to teach about healing. Uh, so she then went into ministry uh, as a teacher on healing. And along with her sister, who was also a medical doctor, both of them uh, started ministry. Uh, John G. Lake is what uh, Ravli will cover next week, so we'll skip that. We go to Fred Francis Bosworth uh, from the USA. So he was a healing evangelist. Fred Francis, what's that? Sorry. Oh, okay. Fred Francis Bosworth. Okay. So he uh, was a healing evangelist. So basically. Uh, he would take the gospel, and along with preaching the gospel, he would also uh, there would also be healings and miracles taking place in his meetings. Um, so 
he wrote a book called Christ the Healer, which was published in 1924. Uh, that book, even today, is considered one of the classic books on uh, healing uh, in charismatic and Pentecostal circles. Uh, in the 1930s, he also uh, started a radio program, uh, which basically was to take the gospel to people. So uh, radio evangelism was pioneered by him. Uh, now, we don't see that a lot in India, but uh, in the US and in other parts of the world, uh, being able to preach the gospel through the radio, this was something that he started. Um, Amy Semple McPherson was from Canada. Uh, so she was a very gifted speaker right from when she was young. and uh, But she was not a believer. And so her father invited her to go uh, listen to a young preacher who was there in their town. And his name was Robert Semple. She went to hear him preach and was impacted by what he said. And so she started to seek God for herself. Uh, eventually, she got married to Robert Semple, and they uh, went as missionaries to China um, because he felt called to be a missionary. And so uh, she went along with him to China. But just within two months of going to China, he fell sick and died. And she was pregnant at the time uh, and gave birth to a baby just a month later. Uh, she couldn't continue, obviously, in China uh, without him there. And so she returned to the US and got remarried. Uh, but she fell very, very sick during uh, that time. And she felt that during that time, God was still calling her back to serve him. She had already felt that right at the start before she married Robert Semple. But during that sickness, she felt that God was calling her. And so she finally gave up and she said, OK, I will serve you. And immediately she got better. So it was that rejection of God's call that had kind of brought sickness upon her. Um, so she, uh, she got better, and then she began to preach the gospel. Uh, in 1915, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. and. Uh, that completely transformed her ministry. She began to travel uh, constantly. And there were thousands of healings, miracles in her meetings. Uh, she started a Bible school. She started radio broadcasts. Uh, and she founded the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. Uh, so this uh, church now has uh, more than 66,000 meeting places around the world. So God used her powerfully. She had a lot of her own personal struggles and challenges and all of that. Uh, but God still used her powerfully to impact the church even today. So that was from the early 1900s. Uh, OK. OK, now we reach, yeah, 1900 to present uh, day, uh, present day church. 1900, we have Charles Fox Pahim. Uh, so he was an evangelist. He was traveling around uh, preaching the word. Uh, and he was, uh, he visited various ministries. So you see John Alexander Dowie, that first person we read about. Uh, and then A.B. Simpson, A.J. Gordon, Frank Sanford. So all of these people were people who had taught about the Holy Spirit and talked about uh, the gifts of the Spirit and healing specifically. Um, after visiting all of these uh, places, he became convinced that uh, he personally needed the Holy Spirit. He needed uh, the Holy Spirit to be poured out on him. Um, but he had that desire for a long time, even before he'd visited these ministries. After this, he was more convinced of it. Um, but there was nothing much that happened, even though he had that desire. In uh, 1900, he started the Bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas. And uh, while he was, he was leading a group of 40 students there, uh, three days before 1901, so before New Year's Eve, he was traveling and he asked the students while he's traveling to read through the book of Acts and look at what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. So what evidence do we have that someone is baptized in the Holy Spirit? 
Uh, and so he left on his travels. And when he came back, the students uh, said, what we can see in scriptures is that people speak in tongues. Uh, most of the instances in in the book of Acts, when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, was that they began to speak in tongues. Um, and so they, as a, church, as a student body and with him, uh, began to pray uh, as the new year was starting. So this was uh, just the day of the last year of 90, last day of 1900. Um, and they were praying, and at around 11 p.m., uh, one of the students, Agnes Usman, asked him to pray for her, pray that she would begin to speak in tongues. He was a little hesitant because he himself didn't speak in tongues and he had never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But because she wanted so badly for him to pray for her, he prayed and she began to speak in Chinese as he prayed for her. Uh, and for the next three days, she was only speaking in Chinese. Uh, so after that, uh, once she started to speak in tongues, the rest of the student body uh, spent the next three days in prayer. And on January 3rd, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the whole student body. And all of them began to speak in tongues, uh, including um, Charles Parham. Uh, and so this place became, that uh, Bethel College became a place where people were coming in uh, to see what God was doing. They were going out and preaching in churches about what God was doing. Uh, but in fall of that year, the college had to close. Uh, so Parham started to travel and talk to churches, talk to people about what God had done here and what God still wants to do in the church. Um, later on in 1905, he started a similar Bible school in Houston. And uh, William J. Seymour, so we'll hear about him in the Azusa Street Revival. He was one of the students at this college in Houston. Uh, and so his introduction to uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, was in the college that Charles Parham started. OK, 1904 to 1905, we'll just look briefly at the Welsh Revival because we'll be looking at it in more detail in the next chapter. Um, so this is considered one of the greatest revivals because of how widely it spread, not only from not only in Wales, but from Wales to other places. Uh, it started with a man named Evan Roberts speaking to a group of youth. Uh, and as he spoke, the Holy Spirit moved in that meeting. Uh, and that move of the Holy Spirit spread all over Wales and to many other parts of the world. Uh, in about six months, in Wales alone, there were about 100,000 people converted. And the society itself was impacted powerfully through this move. Uh, the way things happened, the way uh, practices within society, all of that changed completely because God moved through this time. Uh, we look at what all happened in the next chapter. OK, uh, so the next few people are all things we covered in our student presentation. So John Hyde, uh, Pandita Ramabai, Azusa Street Revival, uh, William Seymour, uh, and then Sadhu Sundar Singh. We looked at all of them in the student presentations. We we'll move to 1906, Thomas Ball, uh, Ball Barrett. So uh, he was from Norway and started preaching at age 17. Um, he was later ordained with the Methodist Episcopal Church of Norway. Uh, as the Azusa Street Revival was happening in California, uh, he was impacted through that through hearing about the Azusa Street Revival. So uh, 1902, he founded the Oslo City Mission. Uh, 1906, he toured America to raise funds. So uh, Oslo is in Norway, and he was doing missions there. Uh, so he started this organization, but then they needed funds to run the organization. So he went to the US in 1906. That is when the Azusa Street Revival broke out. Uh, he went there to raise funds for the work that he was doing in Norway, and he was not able to raise funds. Uh, but he was in a completely different state, in a different part of the US, uh, when the Azusa Street Revival 
was happening um, in California. So uh, he was in New York in his hotel room, and suddenly he was baptized in the Holy Spirit in his hotel room uh, while he was there. And so uh, there's a description of what happened. It was a supernatural light, like a cloven tongue descended over his head, and he received the Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. He felt he spoke in seven or eight languages, uh, just based on the sounds that were coming out of his mouth. He felt in that time that he spoke seven to eight languages. So uh, that is how powerfully God was moving at that time, to be in a completely different place, not at all connected with what was happening in Azusa Street, uh, but for the Holy Spirit to reach him there in his hotel room in whatever work that he was doing. Uh, so from there, in December, he returned to Norway. And through his return, revival spread in Norway. Um, and uh, in September 1907, uh, he went to England, and there was revival in England. Many were baptized in the Spirit, and there was a Pentecostal revival that started in England as well. Um, so yeah, he's called the Pentecostal Apostle to Northern and Western Europe because he kind of carried it from the US to Europe. So when he went back to Norway, there was a preacher from England named A. A. Body. He was an Anglican priest. So the Anglican Church is a much more traditional. Uh, it was something in between the Catholic and the Methodist Church, uh, is what the Anglican Church was. So uh, they definitely didn't practice the gifts of the Spirit and. All of that was still new to the church. Uh, so the, he was an Anglican priest, and he was visiting Norway. And uh, he met with, um, with Thomas uh, Barrett and asked him to go to Norway, because he was convinced that what was happening in Norway was genuinely God's move and the move of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so he invited him back. and. Uh, when he went back to when he went to his church in England, revival spread there as well. Uh, and from his city, Sunderland, England, uh, revival spread in all of England. So people started to come to Sunderland to experience God's move. It was a small town, uh, but it became the center of revival uh, for England. And this is where Smith Wigglesworth received the Holy Spirit baptism. So we looked at Smith Wigglesworth. I think Anthony did Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, but he received the Holy Spirit baptism here. OK, how are we doing on time? OK, we're good. So 1907, now we're moving out of the western part of the world into uh, other, other areas in which revival has happened. Uh, we look at the Korean revival. Uh, now, Korea has had a lot of revivals over many years. We see the list there, 1903, 1905, 1907, 1927 to 1929. Uh, and all of these revivals have impacted how the church is run today. Uh, prayer has become an integral part of the church. Uh, thousands of people gather for weekly prayers. Um, and people go and spend days praying in the prayer mountains. Um, so how revival started? Um, if you look at this place, the city of Pyongyang, it's actually in North Korea, in present day North Korea. But this is where the revival started in 1907. Uh, and Pyongyang is now the capital of North Korea. Um, so there was, uh, in 1906, there was someone named Howard Agnew Johnston. And he uh, took news about the awakenings in Wales and in India to the missionaries in Korea. He told them what's been happening in Wales and in India, and he kind of encouraged them to seek uh, the same kind of thing in Korea. And so they begin to pray. They began to pray for God's spirit to move there. Um, 
So we heard about Jonathan Goforth, right, who was part of the Manchurian revival. So uh, Jonathan Goforth was also in Korea for some time, and he was in Korea during this time of the revival. Uh, he talked about and he said they honored God and appreciated the gift of the Holy Spirit by meeting the church for prayer at five o'clock, not five o'clock every evening, but every morning through the fall and winter of 1906-1907. So they met for months uh, every day at five o'clock in the morning as a church uh, seeking the Holy Spirit. Uh, they honored God, the Holy Spirit, by six months of prayer, and then he came as a flood. Uh, so he, uh, the Holy Spirit moved in power during one of these meetings. And as he moved, people started to just weep uh, because they'd come under conviction of their own sin. Uh, they started to weep, they started to confess their sins, falling on the ground, uh, just crying, uh, crying out uh, in repentance. And as God was doing that, there was also reconciliation happening. There were people like standing up, they would confess their sins, uh, and then everyone would respond crying or uh, weeping, asking God for forgiveness. Um, there were people who would stand up and talk about something they had against another person, another brother or sister in the church. Uh, and there would be reconciliation that was happening between people within the church, even between leaders. Um, so a lot of healing happened, a lot of reconciliation, a lot of release from unforgiveness and hatred. Uh, and within five years, the church grew powerfully. So from 1906 to 1910, uh, there were about 79,000 people who were added to the Korean church. Um, so even today, prayer is very, very important among Koreans. Uh, they meeting early in the morning for prayer, meeting as a church uh, for prayer, uh, going individually like we saw here and they have mountains where people will go and pray in the mountains uh, for days. So all of those things come out of these revivals. Okay, so this uh, revival in Manchuria, North China is what prints covered. Uh, we go to 1909, Willis Hoover. Uh, so, you remember the, the revival uh, in Pandita Ramabai's uh, children's home, right? So, um, this that when that revival was happening, there was someone named Minnie Abraham, Abrams who was working with Pandita Ramabai. So, she was present with her and she witnessed everything that happened. Uh, she was an American Methodist missionary, uh, and she wrote from whatever she witnessed happening in that school, she wrote an account of it. Uh, she wrote a book called The Baptism of the Holy Ghost and Fire, and uh, that book shared about all that she had experienced, all that she had seen happen in the home. Uh, she shared that book with someone named Ma Mary Ann Hoover, who was also uh, someone who had studied with her at Moody Bible Institute. Uh, and Mary Ann Hoover and her husband were Methodist missionaries in Chile. So they were serving there, and she shared this book with them. As they read it, they were inspired to seek God for such a move in the churches in Chile. And so they started to pray about it, and they started to teach in the churches uh, about uh, revival, about the Holy Spirit moving. And the church started to pray for revival. Uh, in 1909, uh, there was a revival that broke out in Chile and um, basically spread to many churches. So today, most of the churches in Chile are Pentecostal churches. Uh, and to think that that had its roots in India because it started with Pandita Ramabai's home here. Uh, and so how God can move across nations, right? One story in one place uh, in a small children's home, moving from here to another nation and impacting the church like even today. Right, so how the church uh, functions today is impacted by that one happening in nineteen in the nineteen hundreds. Um, 
Okay, so 1914, uh, the American Assemblies of God was formed. Uh, so the Azusa Street revival had spread and Pentecostalism had grown worldwide. And so they felt this need for the church to be a little more organized and for there to be accountability within this Pentecostal movement. And so the Assemblies of God was formed uh, by people who were part of the Pentecostal movement. Uh, they came together and so the four things that they were uh, they wanted to focus on were promote unity and doctrinal stability, establish legal, so rec be recognized as a church, uh, coordinate missions, so missionaries that were going out from the Pentecostal church for them to be able to oversee that and be able to send out missionaries, and then uh, establish a ministerial training school. So those were the four things that the AG church uh, focused on. Okay, 1927 to 1939. I think we just have a few more minutes. Um, we go back to China and um, look at revival that happened there. So uh, there were a couple of missionaries, Pentecostal missionaries, who had gone out into China. So 1907, there was a couple that had gone, uh, T. James and Annie McIntosh, and they served for about a year in China. Um, after that, in October 1907, uh, Alfred and Lillian Gad went as missionaries to Hong Kong. So uh, as Pentecostal missionaries were going into China, um, this there was a revival that broke out, but it broke out across denominations. And um, I was reading that the Baptist missionaries were the ones who have recorded the most about this revival. So they talked about how God was moving. And at that time, the Baptist church was very staunchly um, cessationist. So uh, they didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They didn't believe that the, that was still present in the church. But they themselves recorded about this revival and talked about how the Holy Spirit was moving. And those missionaries started to preach about being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, and receiving healing through the Holy Spirit because they were so impacted by the revival that happened in China. Uh, so there was evangelism, there was healing. Uh, so evangelism started to happen spontaneously. People would form small groups and go out taking the gospel to other parts of China. Uh, there was healing, there was repentance of people turning away from sin. Um, so this started in 1932 in Shandong, if you can see it on the map there. And then from there spread into other parts of China. In 1949 uh, is when China closed its doors and all missionaries were sent out of China. Uh, but by that time in 1949, there were about 5 million Christians in mainland China. Uh, from 1949 till today, it's estimated that the church has grown to about 75 million. Uh, so from 5 million to 75 million, uh, huge growth in the church. And that mainly happened through house churches. Uh, that started to spring up because of persecution. So it was easier to meet secretly. And so they would meet as house churches. And the house church movement has spread across China. And people have come to the Lord uh, in spite of persecution. And in spite of not having a lot of support from the outside Christian world, it's mostly been uh, the locals who have uh, taken the gospel, who have grown spiritually and the church has grown that way. Uh, it's thought that China now has the largest number of charismatic Christians in Asia. OK. I'll close with this last one. Uh, 1934, William Cameron Townsend. So he. Uh, Everyone knows about Wycliffe Bible Translators. So he was the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators in 1942. Uh, he founded in 1934 the Summer Institute of Linguistics, 1948 a missionary air service called the Jungle Aviation and Radio Services. So his main 
uh, his main desire was to take the Bible to people in their own language. And this is a quote from him. The greatest missionary is the Bible in the mother tongue. It needs no follow and is never considered a foreigner. Uh, so that's what inspired him uh, to say that uh, the best way to reach people is to give them the Bible in their own language. Uh, if they have that, then uh, even if missionaries are not present, the Bible itself will impact them. Uh, so, yeah, that is William Townsend. So uh, I was also reading, uh, just to add, since we just talked about William Townsend and the Bible being translated, uh, the Korean revival... So um, uh, Korea was completely closed off to Christianity before all of these missionaries went in in the 1900s. Uh, so this was in the late 1800s and was completely closed off. Um, so I don't have the names of these missionaries and I'll get their names for you. But um, there was one uh, man who was, he was 27 years old um, and he was, serving in China, but had a heart to go to Korea with the gospel. Uh, so he learned Korean while he was in China, and he became a translator. Uh, so he said he would go to China with the Americans and be a translator for them. So using this opportunity to go and work in a diplomatic role, he took Bibles in, uh, chi in the Chinese language to secretly smuggle them in as he was going to Korea. So these Americans went in boats to Korea, but there was no diplomatic relationship at all. So they were actually not at all welcome. Uh, Korea was completely closed off to outsiders, but they wanted to go and begin trade. And so he was going with them to kind of use this as an opportunity to take uh, the Bible to them. Uh, so wherever he could, whenever he met any Koreans, any boats that they were coming across, he would give them these Bibles. Uh, but finally, as they were making their journey to Korea, um, the, it became a little bit, uh, basically there was some violence because the Americans were going on a diplomatic thing. They were not going with any Christian or any evangelistic purpose. Uh, and so they started to shoot uh, people in the Korean, uh, on Korean land. And the Koreans sent out boats with fire into this, into their boat that was going, and their boat basically burst into flames. Uh, so while that was happening, this guy threw all of the Bibles, or how many ever Bibles he could, he started to throw it onto the land. He took three Bibles in his hand and jumped into the water and went on land. Um, but he was killed pretty much immediately. He went there, he was like pleading and trying to give them the Bible and all of that, and he got killed. So. 27 year old. Uh, he was killed there. Uh, but years later, when uh, the first missionary went to Korea, he actually met people who had got these Bibles that this man had taken and had one person who had actually read that Bible so many times that when he told him about the gospel, he was already ready to receive Christ because he had read it. Uh, so that's the power that what we're talking about, William Townsend. Having the Bible in your own language is um, is the greatest missionary. So, yeah, close with that story. To south, north is completely closed, no? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for joining online.